Hello, and welcome to the University of Maryland Extension's 4-H Health Rocks training video for weeks 9 and 10. My name is Michelle Harmon, University of Maryland Extension 4-H Program Assistant in Garrett County. Youth learn best when they can participate in a hands-on environment. Whether they are initially successful or run into problems, they learn how to compensate for obstacles. Youth who feel good about themselves are also more resistant to substance abuse and other risky behaviors. One part of this self-awareness is self-efficacy. One factor that impacts self-efficacy is previous experience with success. If youth are successful in reaching a goal or overcoming an obstacle, their belief in their ability is strengthened. Self-esteem, motivation, and self-efficacy fit together. If youth feel good about themselves and believe they can accomplish a goal, they are more motivated. Another factor that plays a role is others' suggestions. Youth are more encouraged when they receive positive support. It helps them feel that they are more capable. Through encouragement, they develop a sense that they are capable individuals. These factors help youth feel more capable and better able to resist temptation and risky behavior. This week's icebreaker introduction is an activity called Sports Gallery. Sports Gallery is a very intensive example of an energizer. The instructor will call out different sports skills. The students have to mimic them for at least 10 seconds. After a while, the instructor can speed up the tempo. Examples of sports skills the teacher can call out include shooting a jump shot, juggling a soccer ball, dancing like a ballerina, batting a baseball, swinging a golf club, etc. Feel free to make your own adaptations to this Energizer icebreaker. This week we are beginning a new chapter. We will be discussing self-confidence and stress. We will learn about self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is defined as one's belief in the ability to accomplish something, to be able to do something, or to be able to act on something. Now we will watch the video for lesson nine. Health rocks, inspired to be substance free. We're now ready to start our third chapter of our health rocks program. And this chapter is all about you. We as mentors and leaders will be working with you to give you the tools that you need to work through this time of transition in adolescence. During this time, you are moving from childhood to adulthood. You're making leaps and bounds in your physical growth, thinking, and other skills. Changes during this time can bring about new friends and shifts in existing relationships. For example, you may be becoming increasingly independent and may depend less on adults and turn more towards your friends. This is a perfectly normal time in your life when you want to spend less time with your parents and more time with your peers. Unfortunately, this is also a time when the risk of tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use begins to surface. Well, as we have learned in past weeks, the number of youth that have major problems with drug or alcohol abuse are relatively small. However, many teens can become stressed and easily swayed during this time, which makes them more vulnerable to various risk-taking behaviors. I'd like to share with you a small video clip of my daughter. Now, just to give you some background on this video clip, she was out in the front yard working on her back tuck. Before I got my, my phone out to start recording her, she had already been in the front yard working for, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes, and she just wasn't getting it. Her brother watched out the window and decided to go out and help her. And that's when I started recording, when he was helping her. You'll see in the video that she's struggling. She kept on going. I didn't record the whole thing. I only recorded a very small snippet of it, but she continued to work. I will say she never got it by herself that day, but she has continued to work. This is self-efficacy. This is that thinking that you are going to be able to do something if you keep working at it. Let's go ahead and watch that clip. Brotherly love right here. She's been out there working and working and working. Jesse's helping her out now. Have you ever tried something new and had difficulty doing it? 
Think about when you learn to ride a bike, swim, or maybe even read. None of these things you were able to do right away. All of these things took time and practice. What would you have if you had given up when it was hard? Where would you be today if you had not worked through that difficult phase and persevered to success? That being said, how do you feel when you have a very difficult task and can do it? For example, your math teacher gives you a tough algebra problem and asks you to solve it. What do you do? Why? Do you give up? Do you work through? Do you ask somebody else for help? When you are not able to succeed in doing something, are you willing to try it again? Are you willing to give that effort to keep going and going until you reach success? If you see someone else do that task successfully and see how it is done, will you give it a try then? This is all part of self-efficacy, which is that belief in your ability to accomplish goals, to be able to do something or to be able to act on something. All of us want to be successful. When we're successful, we feel good and we have the ability to resist unhealthy behaviors. When a person has high levels of self-esteem, they are more likely to be strong and resilient. Research shows that youth raised by parents who help them develop self-awareness and who have a high self-esteem are less likely to engage in destructive behaviors such as underage drinking or drug abuse. Now, I have mentioned self-efficacy briefly. I would like to explain a little bit more about what that is. As I stated, self-efficacy is defined as one's belief in the ability to accomplish goals, to be able to do something, or to be able to act on something. We all have the ability to affect the self-efficacy of people around us. It's the responsibility of all of us to build up, encourage, and support each other. As a group in Health Rocks, we're here for each other. We have talked about trust teams. This is essentially what we are. Within this program, we should all be one big trust team. We should be there for each other. What you learn here, you are encouraged to take home with you. Use these skills with your friends and your family. Make it a goal to be positive each day. Make it a goal to lift someone up each day. This can be as simple as telling someone that you like their smile, or maybe their shirt, or their haircut. Maybe you just need to say hello. It's time to take responsibility for ourselves as well as taking responsibility for those around us. So as we move forward through this chapter of Health Rocks, we're going to be learning how to take responsibility for ourselves, how to build up our self-esteem as well as build up the self-esteem of those around us. We're also going to be learning some tips on how to deal with stress. The first activity for lesson nine involves the Is It Possible handout. Give each student a copy of the Is It Possible handout, reading the directions. The students are to try to connect all nine dots using only straight lines and using only four lines. After you have read the directions, have each participant follow the directions on the first set of dots only. Allow several minutes and be aware of emotions and reactions that are being exhibited. Ask participants who are able to complete the task to raise their hand. There will probably be no one raising their hand unless youth have done this activity before. If someone did complete the task, ask how they feel about being able to finish. Discuss the emotions and reactions that were observed as they worked on the activity. If someone did it correctly, have him or her draw it on a dry erase board or flip chart. If not, put the diagram up and share how to do it. Have youth try again using the second set of dots. Again, ask participants who were able to complete the task to raise their hand. How do they feel now? They may not have completed the task without someone showing them, but they can do it now. Next, give each participant a copy of the It's in the Numbers handout. Have them keep it face down until they are given instructions to turn it over. They will have 20 seconds to circle the numbers starting with one and going up, one, two, three, four, and so on. The number one is in the upper left fourth of the paper. Have them begin. Ask for a show of hands for those who got at least five. There will probably be very few, if any. If some got five, find out what the highest number circled in the 20 seconds. 
ask how they feel about this accomplishment. Give them a second copy of It's in the Numbers handout. Keep it face down. Have them fold their paper into fourths. Fold from the bottom up and side to side without looking at their paper. Explain that the numbers are in order in a pattern. One is in the upper left and going clockwise, two is in the upper right, three is in the lower right, four is in the lower left, five is in the upper left, and so on. When everyone has folded the paper and understands the pattern, give them 20 seconds to do the same task over again. Ask for a show of hands of those who got more than five. There will probably be many more this time. Did anyone get more than 20? Ask them how they feel about this. Did everyone improve? Students can be led in a reflection using these questions. Were these tasks easy or hard to do? Did they seem at first impossible? Were they indeed impossible? What helped you succeed in completing these tasks? How did it feel not to be able to do them? How did it feel when you could do it? Why was it easier the second time? Now that you can do the activity, would you be willing to try it again? Why? How does being successful at something help youth your age? How does failing or not being able to do something affect youth your age? Why is it important to remain motivated and feel successful about yourself? You need not ask all of these questions, but some of these questions may help to lead to an enlightening discussion with the participants. The wrap up of this lesson includes a reflection on self-efficacy. Reflect on the concept of self-efficacy by having youth stand up and form a circle. Take turns sharing one strength. Examples might include being good at math, winning at a science fair, being a good listener, being a good friend, etc. Do not move on to the next person until they are able to share something good about themselves. After each youth has had a turn, start again. This time, the group, the group must list something good about each student in turn. Remind students about the important role that knowledge of personal strengths has in building self-efficacy. The activity for lesson nine is a marshmallow challenge. The challenge is for the students to construct the tallest freestanding tower using only the materials provided. This activity can be done as a team or individually. Each team or individual will receive 20 sticks of spaghetti, a yard of tape, a yard of string, one large marshmallow, scissors and a yardstick to measure may be provided. The winning team or individual is the one who builds the tallest freestanding structure measured from the tabletop surface to the top of the marshmallow. The team's structure must stand on its own for measuring. Teams touching or supporting their structure would be disqualified. Teams or individuals can use as much or as little of the 20 spaghetti sticks, tape, string, as they, as they would like. Extra materials may not be provided. The entire marshmallow must be on the top of your structure. Cutting or eating a part of the marshmallow will disqualify the team or individual. Have fun with this challenge. Lesson 10, all stressed out. Stress is generally thought of as a reaction that makes you feel tense or angry. Sometimes stress is caused by things over which you have no control. However, most stress comes as a result of everyday frustrations and aggravations. Not all stress is bad. Good stress can make you more focused and alert and feel challenged and excited about things. Good stress helps youth accomplish goals and comes from things like school, happy family events, and extracurricular activities, to name a few. When youth are motivated to get good grades so they can graduate, they are experiencing good stress. Getting excited and energized for an athletic event is also stressful, but in a positive way. Yet youth may react to stress differently. For example, someone with a lot of homework might become very tense and agitated, while another person in the very same situation might just get it finished and then relax. However, when stress is uncontrolled, it can take a toll on your body and overall well-being. It can affect relationships with others and performance in different parts of life like school. 
When stressed, it also becomes more difficult to resist various temptations and some youth can end up turning to tobacco, alcohol, and or other drugs for relief. The icebreaker this week is a fun activity called the pig personality test. Each student will need a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil for this completely unscientific icebreaker. To begin, have each participant draw a pig on their paper. They need no further instructions. Give them a few minutes to draw their pig. Explain the object and purpose of this activity to the participants. It could sound something like this. We are going to get to know each other in a fun way. We'll do this by having each of you draw a pig. You can make this pig as detailed as you wish. You will have about five minutes to draw your pig. Please also tell participants they are not allowed to look up how to draw a pig because this would take the fun away. Tell them to give it their best shot without any help and without looking at their neighbor. Please make sure the participants realize they won't have to share their drawing unless they choose to. Now that the participants have drawn their pig, show and read them the pig personality sheet. Have participants discuss the results with the people around them. Ask them if their pig analysis is representative of their personality. After this, explain to the participants that there is no science behind this fun test. Do the participants believe that this test is a representation of their personality? Here is the way the analysis reads. If the pig is drawn towards the top of the paper, you may have a tendency to be positive and optimistic. If your pig is towards the middle of the paper, you have a tendency to be a realist. If your pig is drawn towards the bottom of the paper, you may have a tendency to be pessimistic and prone to behaving negatively. If your pig is facing left, you have a tendency to believe in tradition and be friendly. You may also be prone to remembering dates well. If your pig is facing right, you may have a tendency to be innovative and active, but may be prone to forgetting dates easily and may not have a strong sense of family. If your pig is facing front, you have a tendency to be direct and may enjoy playing the role of devil's advocate. You are also prone to neither fearing nor avoiding confrontational discussions. If your pig is drawn with many details, you have a tendency to be emotional and to focus on the larger picture rather than focusing on the details. You may also have a tendency to be a great risk taker and may sometimes be prone to reckless and impulsive decisions. If you have less than four legs showing on your pig, that may indicate that you are living through a major period of change and as a result, you may be prone to struggling with insecurities. If you have four legs showing on your pig, you may have a tendency to be secure and stick to your ideals. However, others may describe you as being stubborn. If your pig has large ears, that indicates how good of a listener you are. The larger, the better. If your pig is drawn with a long tail, that may indicate how intelligent you are. The longer, the better. I hope your youth have a fun time with this completely unscientific personality test. There is good stress and bad stress. Good stress is normal and can help us complete tasks. When stressful st situations continue over long periods of time, However, it can negatively affect overall well-being. We will now watch the video for lesson 10. Health rocks, inspired to be substance free. Today we're gonna to talk about stress. So when you hear the word stress, what do you think of? For me, I think of having too much to do and how I feel when I feel stressed, kind of overwhelmed, um, maybe get a little bit of a headache, a little bit of a stomach ache. What do you think of when you hear the word stress? In its simplest form, stress is, de is defined as the reaction that our body has to outside stimulus. So there are good stresses and there are bad stresses. So let's think about that for a little bit. Bad stress, is what everybody usually thinks about as stress. It's that feeling of being overwhelmed when you have too much to do and too little time to do it, 
or maybe you've been asked to do a task that you're not really sure that you're up to doing and you get that kind of overwhelmed feeling, a feeling of pressure, you have too many things to try to get done in a limited amount of time, you've got your schoolwork to do, you're trying to learn how to do this online schooling, you've got other chores and responsibilities that you have to take care of and that fill, builds up a feeling of stress. So that's bad stress. Now good stress is something a little bit different. Think about when you are having that last little bit of pressure when you're trying to study for a test and some of us feel like maybe we do better under pressure and that's a kind of a good stress. Think about when you're um, maybe in a game and it's a, a championship game or the game is really on the line and you feel that little bit of pressure. That can be kind of a good stress for some people. They respond better to that and it tightens their awareness, it tightens their focus, and they're able to get more done in a little bit of time at a better performance. Doesn't always work for everybody. Now there are some things that stress can do to our bodies, both good stress and bad stress, that are not so good. Some people have an issue with stress eating. They take comfort in food, and when they're under stress, they have a tendency to go for the chocolate, they get more caffeine, they want that comfort food, some ooey gooey mac and cheese, you know, something like that. So stress eating can be um, a, a harmful part of stress. Stress can also wreak havoc with your sleeping patterns, either causing you to not sleep at all because you're awake and you just can't get your mind to shut down, or possibly even sleeping too much because you just can't bring yourself to face those things that you have to do, those responsibilities or obligations that you have. Stress can also affect your digestion. It can affect how you handle different things like that. You may get stomach aches. Um, maybe you can't eat because your stomach just doesn't feel right. So there's some things like that that it can, that it can harm too. You can cause you to get headaches. Um, there's so many different things that stress can cause that's just not good. So one thing that we need to do is we need to think about how we can alleviate that stress in our lives or at least just maybe get a handle on it. Now the first thing that we need to do in order to do that is we need to think about what causes us stress. So I want you to be thinking about that and maybe even just jotting a list down. What are some things that cause stress in your life? Or maybe not even stress, maybe you don't look at it that way. Think about the responsibilities that you have right now what are you responsible for it can be practicing because you're on a team sport or you're in a band or a dance group or something like that so you're thinking about the practices that you have to go to maybe you have a pet a dog or a cat maybe you raise a market animal for 4-h well that animal is your responsibility the food the feeding and caring for that animal is all your responsibility um, do you have a responsibility to help do chores around the house? Do you have to keep your room clean? Maybe you have to do the dishes, mow the grass, something like that. Do you have responsibilities taking care of a younger sibling? Or maybe you have responsibilities taking care of another family member. So these are all things that can add to your stress as you go through your life because you start looking at this list of everything that you have to do and you start thinking about how many hours there are in a day and it can cause a little bit of stress. It can cause a little bit of a feeling of, of being overwhelmed. So I want you to make that list and think about all of these things that you're responsible for that could possibly be causing you stress. After you get a list made out like that and you're looking at it, start thinking about what you can do with each one of those. Is there anything that you can do to help alleviate some of that responsibility, some of that stress? Now it could be as simple as you need to be better with time management. Maybe you need to look at these things and think, okay, I know that on Monday, I have a test on Tuesday, so Monday I have to study. I also have to make sure that I feed my dog and I need to help my little sister with her homework. So you start looking at those time things. So you maybe on Monday night, you're not able to watch the, the newest um, release of something you wanted to watch on Netflix, or maybe you're not going to be able to spend as much time on TikTok or on your social media kind of a thing. You have to think about those things and look at the timing and try to be better with your time management. It might even be that you're looking at your list of responsibilities and there's something that maybe you're not really that committed to, 
that you can take off your plate, that you can just say, that's really not me. Now this is something that you would obviously wanna to speak to your parents about first and look at that and, and make sure that this is a good decision for you. But that is also something that you can think about, looking at all of your responsibilities and your obligations and just seeing if there's anything that maybe you can change or uh, move a little bit. Maybe um, it could be something as simple as if you do have a dog, it's a family dog. Maybe you can take turns with a sibling or somebody else in feeding the dog so it's not always your responsibility. Something as easy as that could alleviate a little bit of stress in your life. So the main thing that I want you to keep in mind from this talk and what we're going to work on today is that we all deal with stress. Everybody has some sort of stress in their life. We all deal with stress differently and that's something that we can think about and we do have a little bit of control over. We need to also remember that there's good stress and there's bad stress. We wanna keep both of these stresses down so we're not overwhelming ourselves but a little bit of good stress in your life is not always a bad thing. It can help you focus and it can give you that extra little motivation you need to get something done. The activities for lesson 10 include a handout titled, What is Causing My Stress? Give each participant a copy of the What is Causing My Stress handout and a pen or pencil. Ask them to circle the level of stress caused by each item on the handout. Have them add any other items that cause stress on the blank lines. Give each participant a balloon and tell them that the balloon represents them. Read each of the stressors listed on the What is Causing My Stress handout. For each, for each stressor, ask participants to blow a puff of air into the balloon for every point in the score. For example, three puffs for a score of three. Reflect on this. How might the balloon represent a person who has stress in their life? Or a person might be adding more stress to their lives. If a person is not getting rid of some stress, what might happen? How is your body going to feel when stress builds up? There are many things that keep us busy each day and add to our stress. For the next activity, have the students think about the activities and responsibilities that they have. Give each participant two to four balloons and have them blow up all of the balloons and tie each one closed. With a magic marker, have the participants write their activities and responsibilities on the balloons. More than one activity or responsibility may be written on each balloon. Divide participants into groups of three to five. Give each group a magic marker and one large balloon. On the large balloon, have each participant write the name of a tobacco, alcohol, or drug that is harmful. Set that balloon aside. Have each participant select one of his or her balloons. Using one balloon per participant, instruct them to hit the balloon to each other with their hands and keep it in the air for 30 seconds. The group must work together to keep the balloons in the air. If a balloon hits the ground, they must pick it up and start again. Have them keep track of how many times the balloons hit the ground during the 30 second time period. After each group has completed the first 30 seconds, have them add a second balloon for each participant. Again, Keep track of how many times the balloons hit the ground during the 30 second time period. If the group can easily handle two balloons per participant, add a third and even a fourth balloon per participant. Keep recording the number of times the balloons hit the ground during the 30 second time period. When the groups have added all of the small balloons, have them add the balloon marked with the name of tobacco, alcohol, or drug. Explain that they must keep this balloon in the air at all costs. Even if one of the other balloons starts to hit the floor, no one may hit this large balloon two times in a row, and at least two other people must hit this balloon before the first person may hit it again. Have groups track how many times the smaller balloons hit the ground during the 30 seconds. This lesson leads youth to examine the stressors in their life. Use these questions to lead the discussion with the youth. How did you feel when one of your balloons hit the floor? How hard was it for your group to keep two, three, or four balloons per participant in the air? 
How hard was it to keep the large balloon marked with the name of a tobacco, alcohol, or drug in the air? What did you have to do differently to make sure the large balloon did not hit the floor? How can we compare the addition of the large balloon to tobacco, alcohol, or drug use? What effects do tobacco, alcohol, or drugs have on other activities? How can the use of tobacco, alcohol, and or drugs cause stress in life? When a person has stress, it can affect them in several different ways. It can affect them physically, emotionally, behaviorally, and cognitively. Some of the ways may be positive while others may be negative. Each individual handles stress in a different way and stress can affect everyone differently as well. Give each participant the symptoms of stress handout. Ask them to circle symptoms that show how they react to stress, whether it is mild stress or extreme stress. When they have finished, ask them to write an X by those symptoms they experience when they feel a lot of stress. Ask them to share and discuss those. To show what happens when stress builds up, fill a balloon with air, but don't tie the end. Release the balloon into the room. Talk about what happens when stress causes you to lose control. What might happen if your balloon pops or stress gets too much? Some other reflective points for this lesson may be, what causes you the most stress? When you have a lot of stress, what physical symptoms do you have? What about emotional symptoms, behavioral symptoms, cognitive symptoms? Remember, not all stress is bad. Good stress can make you more focused and alert and feel challenged and excited about things. Good stress helps us to accomplish goals and comes from things like school, happy family events, and extracurricular activities, to name a few. The key to managing stress is to know what is causing your stress and what are some things that you can do to relieve or cope with stress in your life. How can you identify if you are under stress? What broad statement can you give about stress and how it relates to tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs? What are some things you can do so that you do not have so much stress in your life? such as making good decisions, cutting down on some activities, hanging out with your friends, etc. Our 4-H activity this week involves a story of who polluted the Potomac. Prior to the lesson, you will have 16 containers that are labeled with different items that have polluted the Potomac. Hand out all of the containers to the students to use during the story. As human populations have increased and land uses have changed, many of our rivers have become polluted. This example demonstrates that just as we each contribute to the problem, we must also be part of the solution. Fill a clear jar or bowl halfway with water. Place the container in a location that will be seen by all of the students. Distribute the canisters to the students and ask them to keep the canisters closed and upright do not reveal the identities of their character or the contents. Explain that you will tell a story about the river and that each of them will play a part in the story. Read the story at emphasis as you read each bolded character name and pause after each question to give the students time to think and respond. As you're reading the story, remind students when you say the name of what they have on their container, they are to come to the bowl and dump the contents of their container into the bowl. This is the story that will be read to the students for them to participate in the story. For many thousands of years, people have lived on the banks of the Potomac River. They hunted in the forest, harvested foods from wetlands, and caught fish in the river. Imagine that the jar of water in front of you was taken from the Potomac River by a Native American about 500 years ago. How does it look to you? Does this look like water that you might want to drink, swim in, eat fish from? One of the first explorers to visit the river kept a journal of his discoveries. He wrote about the Native American villages, the tributaries of sweet water, and seeing so many fish that he and his crew tried to scoop them out with a frying pan. Soon colonists began to arrive. They found fertile land for farming, forest teeming with wildlife, and a river that provided ample food and water. It was an outstanding environment for settlement, and the colonists prospered. How do you think the colonists used the river? 
Possible answers might include bathing, food, drinking and cooking water, transportation, et cetera. Do we use our rivers the same way today? What are similarities and differences in the way we use the river? The river has changed a lot since it was first explored. This is the story of those changes. Listen for the name of the character printed on your canister. When you hear your character named, open the canister and dump its contents into the river. Years went by and occasional storms drenched the area. High winds whipped through the trees and blew leaves into the water. Gradually, the city of Washington, D.C. grew on the banks of the Potomac. Developers cleared the wetlands and forest to build houses and businesses. Rains washed loose soil from the construction sites into the river. Ask if the water is safe to drink. If they say no, ask if the river had leaves or soil in it when explorers first drank from it. Would you swim in it? Is it safe for wildlife? At first, the city was small. Upstream, farmers planted crops to feed the city's growing population. Some of these crops grew right up against the banks of the river and fertilizer washed off the land and into the water. Other farmers kept pigs and other animals in their barnyards. As rainwater drained out of the barnyard, it carried some of the manure into the little creek behind the farm. The creek flows into the river. Would you drink this water now? Would you swim in it? Go boating on it? Is it safe for wildlife? As the city grew, more and more people began to move into the nearby countryside. These rural houses are not connected to the city sewer system. Wastewater from these houses flows into a septic tank under the ground. One homeowner has not maintained the septic tank and poorly treated sewage seeped into the river. To meet the electricity needs of the city, area officials decided that they would need to generate more power. Far upstream, a coal mine was dug. Rainwater drained down the mine shaft and soaked the piles of waste and scraps from mining. This made the rainwater become acidic, sort of like a strong vinegar. Then the acid water trickled off the banks and back into the river. To burn coal and produce the power, an electric power plant was built along the river. Gases coming out of the smokestacks combined with moisture in the air to form acids. The pollution falls back to earth as acid rain or smog. Would you drink this water now? Would you swim in it? Go boating? How could we determine if this water was safe for wildlife? Now, Washington DC is one of the largest metropolitan areas in the country. Traffic congestion is a big problem for commuters who drive their cars to and from work. Car exhaust fumes cause acid rain. If a car is not kept in good repair, it might also leak oil or other fluids, which will be washed off the pavement and into the river with the next rain. And how do the residents of the city and its suburbs spend their time? In one neighborhood, lots of gardeners are out working in their yards. Many of them are using weed killers and insect sprays to keep the lawns pretty. The next rain will wash these poisons into a little creek nearby and then into the river. One father is teaching his daughter how to change the antifreeze in their truck. They pour out the used antifreeze into the driveway. Antifreeze is sweet tasting and can poison animals that lick it. It can also get into the nearby creek and poison fish. Nearby, a boy washes his family car. The soapy water rushes down the driveway and into the storm drain. The storm drain empties into the river. The grease and grime on a car can contain asphalt from the roads, asbestos from the brakes, rubber particles from the tires, toxic metals, and rust. If the boy had gone to a local car wash, the water would have been treated before it returned to the river. Next door, a family is cleaning out their garage. They find an old rusty can with a tattered skull and crossbones label still stuck on it. What could it be? It looks dangerous and they want to get rid of it before someone gets hurt. But how? Junior gets an idea. Let's pour it down the drain by the curb. So the mysterious liquid goes down the storm drain. The poison is out of sight, but it's headed for the river. On nice days, many people head down to the river. Some zoom up and down the river in motorboats and don't notice that a little engine oil leaks into the water. A group of friends have spread blankets on the beach for a beach party. Lots of families are picnicking in the parks too. Some of these people have left trash on the shore. 
With the next storm, that trash will wash into the river. On the shore, a person fishing snags a hook on a log and breaks off the nylon fishing string. Once you have finished the story, if you wish, you can ask some follow-up questions. Who polluted the Potomac? What effect did the increasing population have on the health of the river? Can you think of any ways that population increases helped the river? Think about the, pop the pollution contained in the canisters. Could something be done to prevent these types of materials from entering the water? If so, how? You can challenge the students to come up with ways to clean up the water in the jar. After all, everything has to go somewhere. Once this type of pollution has entered the river, how can we get it out? How can we clean the river? The contents of the canisters are listed on the handout that you have received. They include leaves, soil, fishing line, baking soda, assorted pieces of litter, water, instant coffee granules, dishwashing soap, red, green, yellow food coloring, bits of toilet paper, clean of course, and vinegar. None of the items placed in the canisters would be toxic to any of the youth involved. The idea behind this story and activity is for students to see that we all take a part, that when we look at something like the Potomac River, we all take a part in the pollution that could possibly enter the river and we can all take a part in cleaning the river up. Final reminders, again, please let Ms. Ashley know that when you have completed this video, so that way she knows that you have completed the training for lessons nine and 10. And again, please be sure to turn in your completed attendance sheets after each weekly lesson. Thank you.